about gateways. A um, little bit of education on how they work, a little bit of education on uh, why to use them, when to use them, and so forth. Uh, it's a really unique subject, and as we can tell, not a whole lot of people are really interested in what a gateway is, but when you, when you need it, you really do need it. Okay. Well, I went out and started looking at you know, what is a gateway. And I went to Wikipedia because that's kind of where everybody goes. And you know, it's a, their definition is a network node equipped for interfacing with another network that uses different communi communications protocols. And they didn't go into the seven layer model or any of that. It's just, if this side is different than this side, you need something to make the two talk to each other. And that's what a gateway does. If you look at where the gateway fits in the scheme of things, well, you're connecting building automation equipment together or IT equipment together or whatever. Your, your easiest, uh, most simplistic way of doing that is just connect them together with a wire or a bus. Gets, you get a little bit more complex and you use an ethernet hub. And a hub just simply works by, uh, as you, uh, as you plug the Ethernet cables into a hub, everything that comes in goes out to every other interface. So it's a, it's a star or a broadcast type, type of media. Um, that works well until you start getting, uh, getting volume and you start getting you know, problems with being able to handle all of the volume. So another level of sophistication is a switch. A switch is, is built on the same kind of technology that a hub, except you put another layer of intelligence in there. The, uh, the transmissions only get repeated to where they need to go. So there's some intelligence about the addressing scheme and so on and so forth that uh, uh, helps to control the amount of traffic and, and the volume of traffic. And then you get to a gateway. Well, a gateway and a router are, depending who you talk to, kind of synonymous as far as the, the uh, the wording and so forth. Uh, and the router gets involved when you have to do all those previous things, plus you have to do some translation somewhere along the line because the two, two protocols are uh, just simply not compatible with each other. The easiest thing to think about that almost everyone has in your home is that gateway that you have uh, for, your ca for a cable network to put your computer on the cable network. So. That has to translate between the electrical signals of the, of the cable distribution network and the electrical signals that your computer uses and the TCP IP networking and so on and so forth. But where does, where does BACnet come in? Well, it's, it's the protocol that is ubiquitous throughout the building automation industry. Um, it's pretty much the standard that everyone has settled on. Um, it's not the only thing that's out there serving the industry. Uh, you'll find, uh, you know, if you look for it, quite a bit of Modbus. You still find lawn works out there and so forth. So there, there are more things than BACnet. And a lot of these other things are, you know, serving very specific roles. So, uh, you, you know, you don't, you don't want to do um, the obvious thing and throw everything else away, put BACnet in everywhere. You can't afford to do that. So gateways come into play. Um, in fact, the BACnet organization is recognizing the uh, importance of gateways and the importance of, of other protocols in the, that they've uh, proposed an addendum to the BACnet standard, uh, addendum 135.10.10.AL, that is a best practices uh, document to talk about um, how, how you should implement gateways and what gateways should do and so on and so forth. That addendum is just now going through the review process, so it it's n has not been adopted yet, but uh, uh, it's been pretty extensively reviewed, and a lot of just practical and pragmatic things that people have found work, and we're trying, so we're trying to bring those guidelines to, to uh, into use so that everyone's implementing gateways in a, in a similar fashion. So, but just the fact that, that this, this uh, addendum has been published and is undergoing review is, is a acknowledgement that other protocols are out there. They have power, they have, they have uh, versatility and so forth. And you know, they, need, they need to work with BACnet. 
So the, the mechanism within BACnet that you use to connect multiple uh, networks or multiple protocols is called a, a, a BACnet router. Um, a lot of times it's used to just simply connect multiple BACnet networks. Uh, the concept of a, of a network in BACnet is different than your traditional TCP IP uh, network concept. And just think of it as kind of a, of a BACnet unique um, function of a, of a network or description of a network that kind of overlays the TCP IP network. And that's if you're in a pure uh, BACnet environment. If you're uh, working with gateways, uh, then, then you have a, another function for the router, and that is to um, do whatever translation is necessary, and I'm saying that very generically, we'll, we'll get into more details, uh, in order to let the, the two networks talk to each other. Okay, so uh, when, you're, when you're doing a non backnet gateway, there's, there's two basic approaches. Uh, one approach is to embed all the um, all the non-BACnet or points, I should say, from all the non-BACnet devices into a BACnet device itself, and that that BACnet device will publish those points. Uh, what what you end up with a lot of times is a device that is huge as far as the number of uh, number of points that it has in it. Um, gets the job done, works works very efficiently, but sometimes it is a little bit harder to work with. Um, the direction we're heading is that uh, all, all non-BACnet networks are uh, published through a virtual BACnet network. And so each, each non-BACnet device will have a equivalent BACnet object, looks, smells, and acts like a BACnet device. It's just simply uh, hosted in, in a uh, router or a gateway product. And then, uh, of course, all the points for each of those devices get published under, underneath the device. Well, what, what does a gateway look like? How does, it, how does it come about and so forth? Well, you have uh, two networks that are different protocols. One of them, in this case, because we're talking about the BACnet world, one of them is always BACnet. The other one can be virtually anything else. And you know, what the gateway needs to do is figure out how to get from point A to point B and, and back again. Well, BACnet um, controls everything that you can do and should do and so forth in the BACnet world. Um, the other protocol might have a standards organization controlling it, it might not. It might be a de, de facto protocol that's out there. Um, and, the, and the engine of the gateway itself has to do everything that it, it needs to do to keep both of those worlds happy. Uh, and in, in most cases, the, uh, you know, what gets done is up to the developer. It's, there's, nothing, there's no rules out there that say, well, how do you go about doing this? Or um, what technologies do you use to do it? It's, it's really up to the developer to make things happen, keep both of, both of those protocols uh, happy at, this, at the same time. Well, what kind, what kind of things do you do? Well, uh, some of this I've all already said, but you know, you you do translation. It might be address address translation at the very low level. It might be data object representation translation. Uh, it 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 could be timing that needs to be adjusted. Uh, it could be all of the above, or or you know, many many more things. In some cases, there is no direct translation between your, your BACnet world and your target world. And in that case, um, you know, the gateway engine may need to emulate some of the objects. A uh, perfect example is uh, the BACnet priority arrays. Um, BACnet is the only protocol I know of that has a, uh, a structure of priority arrays in the way that BACnet has it. So the, so in the case of the gateways that we develop, we have to, internal to the gateway engine, emulate those priority arrays. The other thing that's very, very important is the gateway needs to um, do appropriate error, error handling and so forth. So that if, if there is a function that uh, your BACnet system asks for, your foreign network doesn't, uh, doesn't handle, uh, doesn't accept, whatever, 
uh, you, you need to make sure that you at least return an error code. The BACnet knows that you are acknowledging the existence of, the, of a request or of a transaction and so that you can then take the appropriate, appropriate actions to uh, keep, keep the system um, sane, if you will. Well, when do you, when do you use a gateway? Well, we've talked a lot about uh, when two protocols are different and need to talk, and that could be two systems are different and need, and, and need to talk. Uh, that's, that's okay, too. Um, but, you know, you, you look at, well, what drives you that direction? Well, probably one of the main things is cost. If it's too expensive to replace the legacy system that you're talking to, or, the, or I should say the other system, it's not always a legacy system, um, then you need to look at a gateway. Um, you'll, you can get all the functionality that you need. You just simply get it by adding, adding the gateway rather than ripping out the uh, second, second system and replacing it with, with backnet systems. Um, it may be that the, that the non-BACnet protocol or non-BACnet system has some unique characteristics that you need to retain. Another good reason to use a, use a gateway. Um, important thing is uh, when you are doing a gateway, uh, you, you need to make sure that the, your performance needs are met. Um, you know, there's, and the gateways that we've developed, we, we host on a industrial PC with a, with a real-time operating system just to make sure that we do get the, get the performance and, and can deliver the performance that are, that are needed. Um, it always takes some kind of compute power to do the translations that we're talking about. So you, you need to be cognizant of that. Uh, running a gateway on a general purpose PC, whether it's Windows or Linux or what, whatever, operating system really isn't that critical. Um, is sometimes asking for problem because there's there's other applications that you have to timeshare with and so forth. So to get the best performance, you really need a, a dedicated PC. Uh, another reason to use a gateway is uh, a case where a system needs to be upgraded. You need to add value. You need to add functions. You can't afford any downtime. We just saw a, a, a job at the and it'll be one of the examples I show uh, out in Seattle, where a federal building uh, with, I believe it was 37 floors, um, couldn't take any downtime. So they didn't, didn't have the luxury of being able to go out and put new, new systems in. They upgraded it by using a gateway approach. And of course, if you have a legacy system that is you know, doing the basic stuff that you, that you need it to do, uh, but would like it to move into, say, you're doing HVAC control, but you want to do more energy management, a lot of times that can be done at the head end of the system by adding, adding functionality, adding applications through a, access through a gateway. So, you know, what kind of things are you going to do? What, what are your strategies for, for adding a gateway? Well, you may want to uh, coexist with the existing system. Uh, you, you, want, you want to make sure that your gateway is transparent to the existing system that you in no way interfere with the, the system that exists. Um, you know, you have to maintain all the features, all the services and so forth of, of the legacy system. And so, you know, that takes, takes a unique set of functions. Uh, you may want to just simply introduce a gateway because you want to transition, but you want to transition over time. In other words, you can't, you can't afford to replace a legacy system day one. Uh, you can't afford the cost of installing the gateway. And then you, then you do a, uh, a planned migration over a number of years to com complete the transition to a, a pure backnet system. And then there's the, another case where, oops, it broke. You know, your, your head end failed of, of an existing legacy system. Uh, you still have building occupants who you need to take care of. And, uh, you know, sometimes the most expedient way to get that system back, back into operation is put a gateway in place at the head end, put a back net, back net, new back net head end in place, uh, recover the system uh, in the process, probably get new, new features, added functionality and so forth, and get back into operation as soon as you possibly can.
Here's a uh, example of a back, back net to uh, N2 gateway. Uh, N2 is the field protocol used by Johnson Controls Metasys. Um, what we've done in this case is we, we've inserted the, what we're generically calling the S4 open appliance up there uh, in between the head end system and the field gear of the Johnson Controls Metasys system. So in fact, what we're doing in this case is uh, the gateway is working in a couple directions. It, it's, it's working to bring BACnet transactions in and apply them to the N2 field devices. Uh, it's also um, working to bring the transactions coming from the Johnson Control Supervisory Controller into the BACnet world. So it's forcing the, forcing the transactions coming from the J Johnson Medicine System to go through the gateway and participate in the in the BACnet priority array mechanism. So that's that's certainly one one approach. It it uh, inter it interrupts the normal data stream of the um, uh, Metasys system of their field bus, uh, and it, it the gateway becomes the gatekeeper for access to the field bus. It, it determines who and when um, transactions can be submitted and it makes sure that those transactions get sent back to the originating part or part, party, whether that be the supervisor controller or it be your, your new backnet head end. Okay, um, in this case, the, the gateway is salvaging all the field devices. Uh, you, you didn't have to spend any money at all on, um, on replacing field devices on day one. Uh, we've seen anecdotal evidence where once, once you get into a medium complex to complex building, campus, so forth, uh, you can go in and do a, um, a gateway-based in integration at probably 90% less the cost rather than replacing everything. Uh, I don't want to overstate that because you know, that sounds like a, a really astronomical savings. You know, the reality is, over time, you are going to replace all those field devices, and you are going to spend you know, more money, but what you're doing is you're taking control of the situation. So you know, you're determining that day one, you, you, you want more functionality, you want more features, um, you want, want to do some energy savings, possibly, wh whatever. That, that sets the stage for you to do that. It also sets the stage for you to uh, transition the rest of the legacy devices over, over to BACnet, but you're doing it on your terms. So that means that, uh, for instance, say over a five-year period, you, you might uh, have construction going on in parts of the building or on the campus. Well, when that construction is going on, it's an opportune time to um, replace the, the legacy controls in, in that part of the building and, and, and so on and so forth. So. It's, it's, it's a initial investment that you make, but a lot of times it is really the, the initial step that gets the ball rolling toward, towards a to total upgrade of your building in a very cost-effective cost manner. As far as you know, how, how are these things addressed, how is your legacy devices addressed? Well, the BACnet N2 router, in this case, publishes the BACnet IP. Uh, it uses the model where we set up a virtual address or a virtual network, a virtual BACnet network, if you will, uh, and all the N2 field devices each get published as a BACnet device with all, all of its associated points published under it as, you know, as, as standard BACnet objects. Um, what do, you, what do you do to make sure your, your installation is successful? Well, you look for products that have a track record. You look for integrators that have a track record. It takes a unique set of skills for the integrator to be successful. You not only need to know about BACnet, you need to know about the, if, if you will, the legacy, legacy system or the, I should say, the foreign system that you're integrating to. Um, you know, a gateway can do a fantastic job at publishing all, the, finding all the devices and publishing all the points and so forth in the in this foreign network. 
Um, but as, as the integrator or implement, implementer, you need to know what to do with those points to make those devices do what you want them to do. So that, that knowledge is critical. In fact, um, it's as critical as the technology of the gateway itself. Because uh, if, if you don't know what to do with those devices once you've got them exposed to you, uh, you're, you're, you're in trouble. Okay. The other thing that is very important is make sure that you validate the integrity of the foreign system, foreign system or the foreign protocol before you start the integration process. Um, it's the old garbage in, garbage out system uh, principle. Now, if that foreign system is not working when you start the integration process, you're not going to force it to work by putting a gateway in place. All you're all you're going to do is um, propagate the problems that already exist. So you need to make sure that if there are repairs needed on that legacy system or on the foreign system that you're working on, make sure you schedule those repairs up front. Um, in fact, one of the things that uh, we coach our integration partners on is, when, uh, if possible, when you do your contract, uh, set up the contract in such a way that uh, you're the building owner or the building operator um, delivers to you a working field, field gear on a working, working field network and so forth. Um, and that sets up a line of demarcation. What's that really doing? It's controlling risk. So you know, if you get out there and put the gateway in place and things aren't working, well, you've already touched this building, building's network. You probably have inherited it at this point. And I, I see a, a chuckle there. It must must have hit home. Um, you 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 know you've touched it. It's your fault. You own it. You, know, you you need to make it work. Whereas if you go through the validation process of making sure that the legacy system works first, um, at least to the extent that you need it to work, then then you are on solid ground to start the. Uh, installation of the gateway and the in the integration process. Uh, if you find that it's not working, well, you, you have a couple options. If you proper, properly set up your contract, uh, you, you have the ability to go back to the building owner and say, here's what you, what you told me you were going to give us, here's what we have. They don't match. Um, we can't continue until that's fixed. One of two things happen. Change order, and you if you have the skills to fix it or push it back to the building owner and say, I'm going to go do another job until you fix this, this network and we can come back in and, and, and finish our job. So, um, and, and we found a, a, lot of, a lot of cases where that has really proven to be uh, very valuable guidance because, because once, you, once you get in there and you start trying to fix something that's broken, uh, if you're doing it ad hoc, uh, you can spend lots and lots of time and time time translates to dollars here's a uh, uh, example of a uh, you know what I I need to go backwards hold on one second here's an example of a small building um, just uh, I think they had 12 12 field devices in this building um, so it's not very big, not really that complex, but it was expensive to get to the get access to the field gear uh, to replace it. So the the uh, integrator went with the option of putting a uh, a gateway in place at the head end. The supervisor controller and so forth had failed, so the everything in the building was in manual. So with the, a relatively small amount of effort, uh, they got control of their building back and uh, you know could could manage what was happening within the facility and that was all done at, at the head end using a gateway this is the other extreme uh, behemoth of a building this is the Jackson Federal building that I, I mentioned earlier uh, the controls portion was was actually a small portion of the total project I mean this this was a project that took this 37-story uh, building replaced every window in it, uh, re put, a, put a lighting control system in it, replaced all the mechanical systems, uh, and then did a controls up upgrade. So 
our, our partner was involved with the, the controls uh, upgrade part of it. It had uh, 2,300 government employees and contractors in the building. They did not lose one day of work, uh, of, of employee work. They did not have to, have to displace any occupants from their workspaces in order to get the work done. Um, so it was quite, quite a success story. Um, to make things even more, more complex, the building was full of asbestos. So they, the contractor just couldn't get out there and you know, diagnose problems with wiring or with field controllers or whatever without a major, um, major undertaking of asbestos abatement and so forth. So on these 37 floors, there was one case where they couldn't get the network to work. Um, they had to bring in a asbestos abatement specialist and, and clean up you know, one area above the ceiling. They found out that from day one there was a wiring problem that just had never been diagnosed and fixed and um, took care of that. So anyway, this was a, about a year and a half project um, that, that they went through and uh, turns out very, very successful by any, any measure that you want to look at. They added features, they, they came in within, within the cost that they were supposed to, um, minimal interruption to building occupants and so forth. They clearly set a migration path to BACnet, uh, set the stage for ongoing operational savings and improved comfort for the occupants. So every, everything that they set out to do, they achieved on this one. Questions? I know we went we went pretty fast, Steffi, didn't we? Um, it's easy to do when you when you're talking to only a couple people. Questions, comments? Looks like we're done. Thank you, everyone.